All right. I guess I've been uh, sitting here at home thinking that you will all be missing my lecture. So I thought I would record a video lecture to replace my uh, sick day lecture so you get to hear my froggy voice anyway. It makes sense to do this because the material that I want to talk about isn't actually available in the textbook anyway. So, might as well record it. So what I'm going to talk about today is evaluating the sensitivity of changing sensitivity of polynomials to changes in their coefficients. So we need to compute a condition number for that. So this is the theory. I'll begin with the theory. So we're going to start with the uh, general polynomial. So just a, a general polynomial, p of x, and it's a sum of coefficients ck times uh, basis polynomials phi k of x. So the, the green ck is the kth coefficient, k running from 0 to n, and the basis polynomials can be anything that we happen to be using for reasons that we like. So it's very standard to use the monomial basis, the polynomials phi0 is 1, phi1 is x, phi2 is x squared, phi3 is x cubed, and so on, up to phi n is x to the power n. But we've seen that Chebyshev polynomials are uh, also a possibility. So Chebyshev polynomial tk of x is cosine of k theta, where theta is a function of x by x equals cos theta, so theta is arc cosine of x. And these give polynomials 1x, 2x squared minus 1, 4x cubed minus 3x, etc., all the way up to the highest order one. And they turn out to be really useful in a number of contexts. We've also seen the Lagrange basis polynomials. So if we have a Lagrange basis on n plus 1 points, n plus 1 distinct nodes, then L0 of x would be uh, x minus tau 1 times x minus tau 2 all the way up x minus tau n divided by x0 minus tau 1, x0 minus, uh, pardon me, tau 0 minus tau 1, tau 0 minus tau 2, etc. all the way up there. We've seen that in class. So we might have our polynomial expressed as a linear combination of these, or a linear combination of these, or a linear combination of these, or really anything. The theory of understanding the sensitivity of these polynomials to changes can be uh, examined most easily, I think, in the following way. If we're going to change p of x to p of x plus delta p of x, where the change occurs by changing each of the coefficients by a small relative amount, so say ck gets replaced by ck times 1 plus sk, and sk is a small relative change to the kth coefficient. You can think of that as a percentage change. Uh, this theory was articulated first in the way that I really like by Faruqi and Rajan about 1988. Um, from here, it's really easy to see that the change delta p of x arises just because it's ck times sk times phi k. If we subtract this thing from this thing, obviously we get delta p plus p minus p, we just get delta p, and when we subtract uh, this thing from this thing, the ck times 1 times phi gets, wipes out the ck times phi, and all we're left with is ck times sk times phi k in each term. So sum from k equals 0 to n of ck times sk times phi k gives us just delta p. And then the triangle inequality says that the absolute value of delta p of x is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of all the terms. So we have absolute value of ck, absolute value of, of phi k times absolute value of sk in each one of those things. And then we can replace each absolute value of xk by the maximum possible value of the xk's, and then that'll be common, and we can pull that all, all out. So we have this thing, which depends on the coefficients and the phi's and the x, but it doesn't depend on the perturbations, uh, the small changes. And then we have this part, which is just purely about the small changes. So we've separated something to do with the polynomial, something to do with the changes in the coefficients. So this number in brackets, and it's a number, it's a function of x, but it, once you fix x, it's just a number, um, is what I call the condition number of the polynomial p at x with respect to changes in the coefficients. 
if we're working in monomial basis, then this is the sum of the C0 times 1 plus the absolute value of C0 times 1, the absolute value of C1 times the absolute value of X, and so on. And that's what we'll look at as an example first. So I'm just going to cover this up for a moment. And we'll look at a graph that I've prepared of the node polynomial um, x minus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 3 times x minus 4 times x minus 5 times x minus 6 times x minus 7. So that's just... Uh, a polynomial with zeros at x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, x equals 4, x equals 5, x equals 6, and x equals 7. And it's monic. We have just a pure power of, of x. When we expand it, we get x to the power 7 minus 28x to the power 6 plus 322x to the power 5th minus 1960x to the power 4 plus 6000 769x cubed minus 13,132x squared plus 13,068x minus 5,040. The b of x you get by taking the absolute values of everything. So the absolute value of x to the power 7 plus 28 times x to the power 6 plus 322x to the power 5, etc. So all plus signs in there. So there's the b of x that goes with this uh, node polynomial expressed in the monomial basis, 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, x to the sixth, and x to the seventh. Now we come to the dynamic action part of this uh, uh, video. I spent some time with this funny little calculator here, and I worked out the values of this polynomial, and I plotted a bunch of the values on there. I worked out where the local extrema were. There's a place with a slope zero there, place with a slope zero there, place with a slope zero there, etc. And then symmetrically uh, over here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, yeah, six places where there's slope is zero. And now we're going. I'm going to dramatically fill in the the uh, the curve. Now, of course, I'd really like to have an actual old-fashioned spline. Uh, the the bendy, thin piece of wood that w I could nail down onto those pieces and put it in there, but I don't actually have one anymore. I used to have one a long time ago. But now I'm just going to do this freehand. Uh, not very well, probably, but anyway. We have to go through the origin there. Come up, and... Now I'm not doing very well on the freehand here. Luckily, it's in... In pencil. I'm missing 90% of those points, but you get the general idea. The, this particular polynomial has all of these zeros. Tidy that one up a little bit here. And the oscillations are out towards the edge or starting already, even though this is only degree 7. We've seen examples of the node polynomial having really extreme oscillations, and it's because the zeros of this polynomial are equally spaced apart. This is actually a very cut down version of what's called the Wilkinson polynomial, the product of x minus 1 times x minus 2 all the way up to x minus 20. So the degree 20 polynomial has incredibly violent oscillations out here, but it kind of calms down in the middle and then really has violent oscillations out there. But on the scale for human drawing, which I did to slow this lecture down a little bit, this is actually about right. You can actually see the oscillations, and you can see that it's calmer in the middle and wilder on the outside. So this makes this is a, a nice example of a polynomial that uh, has alternating signs. So minus 28 plus 322 minus 1960, etc. So when we take the b of x, everything becomes positive. And this is actually 
substantially different to the original polynomial. So the, the behavior of b of x is going to be different to the polynomial that we had originally here. And in particular, out near x equals 7, if I plug in x equals 7 here, all of this stuff adds up to about 17 million. So this says that on this range, the condition number for evaluation of this polynomial is about what could be a, a, a size 17 million. And that has some rather dramatic consequences for uh, what happens to changes in this particular polynomial. So let's just take a quick uh, look at what happens. If I change the 28, the second coefficient, the minus 28, if I change that 28 to 28 times 1.0001, so change one part in 10,000, then the roots, which were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, change to 1, 1 1.998, so that's pretty close to 2, 3.048, that's pretty close to 3, 3.76 is not very close to 4, but it's, you know, it's probably the 4 that changed to that one. 5 and 6 are gone. And the 7 changes to 7.2993. Well, where did 5 and 6 go? Well, you actually have to look in the complex plane. There are two complex roots, 5.4475 plus or minus 0.6747i. So if we draw the roots in the complex plane, we have sort of 1, sort of 2, uh, sort of 3, sort of 4. Oh, these two complex roots way out here. And sort of six. So what has happened in changing the 28 to 28.0028, if we just think of this number uh, gradually coming up to this, if you think of 28 gradually changing to 28.0028, the roots would gradually change. What would happen is that the roots initially at five and six would come together and they meet and then they go off into the complex plane. So it makes for a dramatic change so change the roots by one part in 10,000, and the roots change by about, uh, well, about one half, close to, you know, maybe a little bit more than that, maybe about 0.8. So that's less than the predicted condition number of about 10,000, or pardon me, uh, 17 million, but it's still substantial. So that, that condition number that we had before is a bound, and it can be actually achieved, but uh, often the changes are less than that. But if that condition number is large, then dramatic changes can happen. The role that the condition number B of X plays in root finding is something that I haven't talked about in this video, but it is directly relevant. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in class. Stop recording.